Wah. Picture this. It's you Wah. and you're sitting there. Where? On a on a bench. In in your house. At first you're vibing, you're chilling, and you're happy. Then all of a sudden, you're not. Why? Age. You're remembering how old you are, and to get your mind off of it, you decide to play some video games. Sure, it works for a little bit, but then you start to think about video games when you are much, much younger. And once you start thinking that, you get that little uh, itch, you know, that you just want to play those games again. And that is why we are here today. And if you couldn't tell, that was me in that story. Hi. Hypothetical me here. A few days ago, I turned the fun age of 21, meaning after this, it's just gonna go downhill from here. I got myself a gift though, hold on. You wanna see what it is? It's a grommet mug! All 21 years of this earth has led me to getting a grommet mug. What was I talking about again? That means that I was born around the early 2000s, where the gaming space for children was much different than it is now. You had the family computer with the folders of all those CDs, you know, this folder. But before I started working on this video, I asked people on my Instagram and on this Discord that I'm a part of, what were some games from your childhood you remember playing? Looking at this list I got here, I have some notable ones like the early 2000s Lego video games, Wii Sports, Toontown, Minecraft Pocket Edition, PC was too expensive for us, and some underrated ones as well that I'll just start flashing on the screen. Now look, all those games I was sent, they're fine. I played some of those, but that's not what I'm looking for. I'm talking about the old DOS games. We got I Spy, Thomas the Tank Engine, Arthur. There was these certain games that I remember from this one game developer that just hit home for me. Have you heard of Humongous Entertainment? Now, some people are like, yeah, I've heard of their games, you know? And some people are like, I don't remember Humongous Entertainment. Well, let me say these two series they had for children education, Putt-Putt, and Pajama Sam. They're the guys that made that. They're the guys that made those games. Also, I didn't even realize this. They made a few Blue's Clues games, but that's not what's important. What's important is that they also made the Backyard Sports games. I didn't grow up with them, but I know some people do. And seeing that not only did they make the Putt-Putt and Pajama Sam games, but they made these games as well. Oh. Oh, now me saying those names has probably hit you with like a wave of nostalgia, just just getting punched, just getting ganged up on you. Freaking curb stomp. On Humongous Entertainment's website, they were stated as the pioneers of the genre that was both educational and entertaining by combining cognitive skill building puzzles with traditional Disney style pepper animation using cutting edge proprietary technology. They also mentioned the replayability and the multiple endings to their games. At the time, nobody was really doing what Humongous was doing. People were making games for the kid demographic, but they weren't making games for the child demographic. You know, babies. They would produce these games in a 10 year span starting from 1992 all the way to 2002. Not only did they produce two series of children education games like Pub Pony and Pajama Sam that I mentioned, they'd produce two others which was Freddy Fish and Spy Fox. I grew up with Pajama Sam and Putt Putt. Spy Fox and Freddy Fish are new to me and because Humongous wanted to go out and do what they said they wanted to do, they made these four series of games that was more targeted to a certain age range of kids, which I'll flash right here from 2002. So then it got me thinking, I wanna play a good game from my past, and this could be a good video. Put it together, and here we are. That is why I'm gonna take on a task to play one of each of these games. My goals are to try and finish it and see if they are good as I remember, does it do the job Humongous set out to do, and is the replayability there. Last thing I wanna mention is that I have more things to say in the beginning that are also just gonna carry on into the later games, like the point and click features and their multiple endings. Also, I recorded my gameplay and put my face cam on so you get to see my reactions and uh, commentary on these games. Darkish. Uh, 
Ready? Oh! Uh, <gasps> With that being said, here I go to play one of each of Humongous Entertainment's children educational games. Back to the Future is a bunch of bullshit. The first series I am diving into is Putt Putt, which is also the beginning of these children educational games from Humongous. Now, for all except for Pajama Sam, I played each of their highest rated games from their series. For Putt Putt, it was one that I played before, which was Putt Putt Travels Through Time. The reason why I am playing this and getting giving it an exception even though I've played it before is because I swear to god I, f I don't remember finishing it. I don't remember completing it or finishing it at all. So this is more of like a redemption to show six year old past self that I am now a true gamer. Also this is when Putt Putt went through a redesign going from a more 8 bit design to hand drawn and wow it looks so much better than what they had before. It looks less cursed and creepy and more like cartoonish and this is a kid but as a car instead of it looking like it's going through puberty but onto the game the plot of the game is that travels through time takes putt putt going to visit firebird to show off his history report calculator and his authentic smoky the fire truck lunchbox Okay, once he gets to Firebird's lab, and definitely not a factory because in an earlier game he accidentally sends Putt Putt in space, he is putting the finishing touches on his time portal. Hey, Mr. Firebird, going, Mr. Say, Firebird? Some, Firebird? say some, say some, say some wild shit. Mexicans make burritos. That's not wild, I can't believe you'd even say that. The only thing that's missing is that he needs 5 cents to activate the machine, which it seems like he doesn't have. Sounds like a huge flaw to put in your machine, doesn't it? <laughs> but once I inserted my hard earned 5 cents, the machine goes haywire and sucks up the 3 items and a dog pep. You dumb dog. Oh, you got it. So now Putt Putt is tasked to retrieve his lost items so Firebird can close the portal. We have four time periods to look for our stuff being the prehistoric, medieval, old west, and the future. But first, music number from these four. Now to find these items. Sometimes it can be as easy as it just being in the same place and taking just a few, very few steps to get to it. The first place I looked was in the prehistoric age and went to the Brachiosaurus until I found a big rock. I took a big rock and asked the blue dinosaur to move her tail so I could continue. Also in every age, you'll meet a stage of a car. Like in this time, it was a wheel with a stick in the middle named, um, wheel. After helping him lower the bridge and fitting the hole with the other big rock I found, I went to the left path and there's Pep. All I had to do was awkwardly scratch this dinosaur's back. A bit more to the right. I did. A little more to the right. What do you want from me? Use him as a bridge and boom, I have retrieved Pep. But there also is the chance of having to just do a little bit more work of puzzle solving and traveling back and forth through time frames to get to the item that you need. For example, in the medieval age was where the history report was and the king was using it for a story time. We asked for it back, but he uses the Thingman the Dungeon card. Putt Putt comes up with the idea of the king giving it to him once he's done reading it, but the king thinks it's so interesting he wants to read it every day. Basically, no. We shall begin as soon as I find an appropriate passage. I'm sorry, what? You haven't even started reading the paper yet? So our task now is to get a book to replace with our history report. To do that, I had to go to the library in the future, pick the book on the topic he wanted, and return back to the castle to make the trade. Also, I'm blue now. I hope you don't mind that. I look good. But while you're doing that, there's also mini games along the way that you can do for fun. In the prehistoric age, you can find this yellow dinosaur to move the rocks in the correct position for the picture. There's also Follow the Volcano, which is a rhythm game. Whatever this game is in the medieval age, where you hit the birds with the balloons. And whatever this game is in the future, to get the pinball to hit the square boxes to make a picture. While the mini games can be fun and enjoyable, don't forget that this is a point and click game. For me, I knew what to click because the item might have looked a bit more highlighted than the rest or i just remember from memory but children are gonna click everything and the randomness that comes out of the places that you click is just such a great feature especially when i can do this i don't need another rock i don't need and this will more more Endless chipmunk and squirrel. Endless chipmunk and squirrel. Last thing I want to mention gameplay wise goes back to Humongous stating their replayable storylines and multiple endings. If you were to play this game again, most likely it's not going to be the same experience as last time. What I'm trying to say is, say you play the game and you finish it, 
You want to play it again? Guess what? Most likely, they're not going to be in the same place. To showcase this, I played Travel Through Time again, and I only did it for this one. Everyone else is a one and done. I wish. Instead of Pep being in the pterodactyl nest, he was stuck in the desert. The calculator was now in the museum, the history report was under this dino's foot, and the lunchbox was being held on by the dragon. Some things may stay the same, but the locations of the items may change, and now you have to figure out a different way to get them back. But once you get the fourth and final item, you jump out of the portal, Firebird locks it up for good, and you go to school to talk about what you learn. My only negatives for Putt-Putt that also spans across the other series is that I couldn't skip the cutscenes. Should not have been this stupid. Can I can I skip this? One, two, Do you want to play again? No. Like I get it for later on in the game especially because of the multiple endings but it is the same gameplay till you go into the time portal. All I have to say is that the animation and locations look amazing for its time. The replayability for this game is there and it's no surprise why me and my sisters loved playing this game when we were young. Already off to a good start but now it is time to jump into Uncharted Depths for the next game. Get it! We're surrounded by fish. Horny fish. You know what that means. Fish. The second series that was next was Freddy Fish, and the game that I played was Freddy Fish and the Case of the Missing Kelp Seeds. Again, I didn't really play Freddy Fish growing up, so for my first time and going into this with pretty low expectations, honestly, it's pretty solid. The story for this game is that you play as Freddy Fish going to visit Grandma Grouper, where she reveals the bad news that someone stole her treasure chest holding all of her kelp seeds. I'm sorry, did I say all of her kelp seeds? <laughs> I meant all of the kelp seeds. Your treasure chest that holds all the kelp seeds? She got a monopoly on these kelp seeds, I guess. Freddy takes on the task to find her kelp seeds, and on the way, he runs into his friend Luthor, which gives me PTSD of Scrappy-Doo. He tries doing this loop-de-loop -loop thing unsuccessfully until he bumps his head too many times for a bottle to fall off of a rock, which reveals the path to where the kelp seeds are hidden. So now Freddy and Luthor need to solve puzzles to find the bottled hints that'll lead them to the chest before the Squid Father's shark goons remember the location and get to it first. So on my playthrough, I ran into too many games, if you want to call one of them that. One being a memory game, remembering which clam had the pearl, and the other being addition and subtraction with the starfish. I played it on the advanced difficulty, and solving problems with big numbers can be hard for children ages 4 to 6. This game has a little pet peeve of mine that I've always had, and that's whenever I play a game, and they give me something, and I end up not using it. For example, this manta ray named Ray, no shit, tells us to get through the shrimp net we need to get from him. The super duper duka buka polygizmo. Okay, now try saying that five times fast. I didn't even look into my script for that, so pat on the back for me. <laughs> <laughs> but to get that, you need to give him a clock. Once you do that, he hands you the gizmo that helps you get through the net, which leads you to the clam pearl game. And if you remember where it was, you get a pearl. Now what do I do with this? Nothing? Oh, okay. My playthrough didn't require me to get the pearl to advance any puzzle. Same with the violin crab and his fishing rod. Same thing kind of applied to the locations as well. Like there wasn't anything waiting for me at the volcano area, but there was a theater performance and I can definitely see children messing around in that area and have fun. But what was the point of this? Would you have- would there have been a bottle here for another playthrough? Again, this is a more personal complaint from me, but still thought it was worth mentioning. Although the game is set in one location being the ocean, the game's hand-drawn animation still looks great, how amazing, and they don't even oversaturate the ocean with lighting, nor does it look too dark and boring. And even though it felt like I didn't interact with most characters, some that I did were charming like Ray and this pirate fish that likes to say "ar." Arr. What if like the grandma finds out like you know like oh where did you go and it's like oh we went here and here and here and the grandma's like you what the game ends when you get to the pirate ship that has the treasure chest with the kelp seeds to do that you need to trade the fish the crutch for the mandolin which you trade the pirate fish for his crank and you make it to the chest but uh oh the sharks remembered and now they're here too after a heated back and forth they decided that they and I kid you not should share the kelp seeds if we share the seeds we can and all grow kelp. I got an idea. 
We can share the kelp seeds. <laughs> Great idea, boys. What? Wait, what? And now Freddy and Luthor spread the kelp seeds throughout the sea. We come back, it's like, Grandma, we found the kelp seeds. Like, where the fuck did they go? You spread them everywhere? It was gonna be in my garden, and I was gonna share all the seeds with everybody. Now they're everywhere. Freddy, I'm, I'm screwed. You. Once they return to Grandma Grouper, they plant the seeds in her garden, they hug, and boom, game's over. I saved your treasure, Grandma Grouper. Well, okay, Freddy. Oh, fuck you, Luther. Play. I'm honestly glad that I can either immediately restart or exit the game instead of waiting for the credits to roll, like with putt putts. I can definitely feel a difficulty spike in this one, but not by much. But it was also the quickest to finish, too. Putt putt took around like an hour or so, whereas Freddy Fish took about 40 minutes. And that mostly is to do because I spent a bit more time playing the mini games in Putt Putt, where it was more of like, I just do it once at Freddy Fish and then I can just get on out of there. But I also was at the addition and subtraction one for a while, so there's that as well. In conclusion, still a pretty good game and we're going on a good run right now. Very little complaints, and I came out liking this game more than I thought I would. Now to look into one that I've been just waiting to cover. Can I have cheeseburger, please? Nom nom nom. Mmm, cheeseburgers. The third series I'm looking into now is Pajama Sam, and the game from that series being Pajama Sam 3, You Are What You Eat From Your Head to Your Feet. Like I mentioned, this one isn't the highest rated Pajama Sam game. The one that is, is the one that I played when I was a child, which was Pajama Sam, No Need to Hide When It's Dark Outside. The reason why I'm skipping this is because I actually finished this game. Completed, that's debatable because I don't think I collected all the socks, which is a side quest type of thing that I'll talk about later on. But all I know, I definitely did play it and finish it. In this scenario for Sam, we see him eating a boatload of cookies that would give any child at that age type two. He's doing this to get the limited edition Pajama Man with Titanic Elbow Thrust by collecting enough box tops. That's when his mom calls Sam for supper, if only she knew. Then without warning, the cookie box starts to shake. Boom! The cookies explode out of the box to run amok in the pantry. Once Sam is suited up, he embarks to stop the cookies, but gets ambushed and thrown into a world of food. Sam falls into a sweet <laughs> party and horks down a huge cake slice so he can go back home. I can't believe I ate the whole thing. This kid's gonna get diabetes. You ate it, Sam. You ate it, Sam. That cake had a family, Sam. How could you? Unfortunately, Sam says some words that were not appreciative and gets thrown into sweet jail, which then follows up some wild and quirky events. You can just wait here in oh. jail until your trial next month, healthy boy. Is this like racism? That broccoli girl's seen some shit. My name's Sam. I'm Florette. Are you a political prisoner too? What? Know. Hmm. The sweets don't always get along well with the other food. Oh my god, it is! <laughs> Once you manage to break out of jail, you head to the food pyramid where you find Carrick, who was actually from the previous Pajama Sam game I mentioned. He fills us in that the food groups are not getting along at all, and General Beat wants to declare war. The island of Mop Top is in big trouble. Mop Top? <laughs> yeah, Mop Top. The mopping on my top. Mop she right. mopping, she mopping on my top to like, she topping on my mop to like. To stop the fighting, Carrick decided to hold a peace conference and have one of each of the six food groups come and talk out their differences. Bad news is though is that there's only two out of the six delegates there right now. The other four are missing. Our job now is to get all four of the missing delegates to the peace conference, which are all stuck in their own situations. While you're doing that, make sure you keep your eyes peeled for the box tops, which was from the beginning of the game, which are now scattered all over the land of topping on my mop. You need to collect 20 so you can win that Pajama Man action figure. It doesn't do anything gameplay wise, it's just a neat little side quest really. Like I mentioned in the game that I played, you had to collect socks which I remember being a bit more challenging than what the box tops were in this game. But comparing the difficulty from Pajama Sam to Freddy Fish, it is much more noticeable in Pajama Sam. For example, in the food pyramid, there's a library that holds a book manual that you'll need for the bean delegate. You have to complete a little mini game to get to the manual, but try not to get caught by the garlic librarian or you'll have to start over. Now, this is in my footage and you'll find out why in a bit, but Take a good look. Here, the guy had the book spawn pretty close by and pretty easy for him to get. You know where mine was? Up here! The garlic guy is almost always chilling up there. Unfortunately, my face cam was blocking it, but you can still hear me struggle to get it. Hey, 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 
Hey, hey, hey, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Go, 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 motherfucker. Go, 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 No, don't get jump off. Yeah. 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 Fuck you. What? And not only that, all of that was just to get told that I need a library card to take the book with me, but I need to get a picture for my library card. <clears throat> now the best thing about Pajama Sam is hands down the design of this game. It is just so creative. It is the most creative out of all the series when it comes to their design. It just feels so much more unique as you travel through Mop on My Top Till I Drop, which is a huge system of the body, Muscle Beach, a funny bone comedy show, a literal heart. And when it comes to the puzzle solving, it just feels so much more rewarding when you solve it. Like when it came to talking to the egg about how he likes his fries with vinegar, and you stop by the tree and find the vinegar to put on the fries, block in your path. Same thing with the wrench, both being used to fix the leaky hose on Muscle Beach, which starts the process of saving Pierre and Le Pan, and then fixing the clogged pipes, which then starts the process of helping Granny Smythe by trading out the plungers with rocks so I can get Granny Smythe out of that sticky situation, which took me seven minutes longer to find her than I would like to admit. Wait a minute. God damn. But once you save all four of the remaining delegates, they talk, they argue, Sam delivers a harrowing speech that gets everyone to work together. Peace is brought back to the land of she mopping on my top, and the game ends with Sam going back home for supper. Honestly, this feels like the best out of the four games that I've played. Maybe my bias is showing because I've played Pajama Sam before, like Putt Putt, but with Pajama Sam this time, it just felt nice going back to something I was more familiar with, but playing a different game from that series. And that's why it's a little bit higher than the rest. But let's end it off with the last series for this video. Oh boy. The last series is called Spy Fox, and the game from this series is Spy Fox and Dry Cereal. The plot goes that it appears the world's dairy and cows have gone missing due to the dastardly villain William the Kid. Spy Fox is sent by Agent Monkey Penny to figure out what William the Kid has done with the dairy and stop his plans of replacing all of the dairy with goat milk. Here's the only clue we have. Feta cheese. That's... Grade. If you can't tell, Spy Fox is heavily inspired by the James Bond movies just by just him. And during this time, they brought back James Bond as well with a new actor being Pierce Brosnan, who I've seen on list being always in the top three of best James Bond actors. This is also when the Got Milk craze started to happen and really be just be everywhere. So it wouldn't be crazy to assume that Humongous saw that, hey, People like spy movies like James Bond, and people like the God Milk thing. What if we... Well, if you couldn't tell by my voice, this is to me probably the weakest out of the four in this series. Spy Fox is definitely the most different and Waldo, if that's like even a term you can use, out of the four. You had Cartoon Dog, Fish Buddies, Kid using its imagination to pretend to be like his favorite superhero, and then boom, International Fox of Mystery. Now I already mentioned this earlier with Putt Putt, but I couldn't skip cutscenes is what I thought. So playing Spy Fox felt more what I thought Freddy Fish was gonna be like, which was a slog to play through because the cutscenes were just taken forever. It didn't feel like it was that long when it came to the other three games and their cutscenes, but Spy Fox just felt like it was just too much. For the other three games, it felt quick and brief and told me that all I needed to know with my short attention span. Hey, look a penny. But Spy Fox takes forever. Ever. Do you want to know how long Spy Fox cutscenes take? Starting with Putt Putt, from the beginning cutscene to end, it takes about a minute and four seconds. Freddy Fish was about a minute and 55, and Pajama Sam was about a minute and 28. Spy Fox, if you immediately select the right pen and get the pogo stick, and they stop showing you the menu when you land, takes about 
five minutes. The showcase of each spy gadget from the professor takes between 20 to 40 seconds and there's six of them. Thankfully, the beginning cutscene is the longest one, but there is some that can be a bit long too. There's the cutscene saving the cow guy and him explaining the situation, which takes about three minutes and 20 seconds. Then the scene of foiling the flow of milk and William talking about it, which takes about two minutes and 40 seconds. Then getting on William's evil blimp thing takes about two minutes and 20 seconds. Maybe the beginning cutscene just left a bad taste in my mouth. That and just the puzzles are less, less obvious to solve than in the last Three. And I know that I said that I was only going to replay Putt Putt, but damn it, I replayed Spy Fox to see if I can just get a better experience. And I can say this playthrough was better than the first storyline I played through, and I figured out a second ending too. The first ending I found would be you chase William down and manage to hump on his evil blimp. You manage to get his blimp over the bad guy jail, mess with the chair's settings to eject him into the jail, and be rewarded by Bill Clinton. Bowl? And boom, that's the end. But in my second playthrough, ending two can go a little bit like this. Ending two has you chase William down and you do nothing. You miss the ramp and let him go. And instead of a big ass cookie, you just get a cookie. And that's when I figured out I could skip these cutscenes the whole time. <laughs> I wonder which I hate to So you tell me I could have oh, that's... oh my god Did I mention by the way this goes for every single other game I went back to play it I don't need to show you proof just just, just listen to my words you can do this with every other game as well. And God damn it. <laughs> okay, look, Spy Fox is a nice game and the replayability is there. But if you don't know about the skipping cutscenes and such, eh, put this off as the last one. Also, the best character in this game is the Pelican guy who serves no other purpose than showing you his ever changing tattoo. Well, there you go, that's one of every children education game from Humongous Entertainment. Breaking the games in order from least to most favorite, it's probably what you expected it was gonna turn out to be. From least to most favorite, it goes Spy Fox, Freddy Fish, Putt Putt, and Pajama Sam at the top. For those who have seen my content or have just been subscribed to me, which you should do if you haven't already, you know I like to take a look back into my past, like with Schoolhouse Rock and Chatter Chipmunk. But those were both shows or films, whatever you like to classify it as. But taking a look at what some people might classify this as, some obscure games from my past, was really fun to do. Plus, these games from Humongous Entertainment are really good children education games still. From the puzzle solving, the animation, to the replayability, yes, even in Spy Fox. It's all there for your child. And I want to end this video on answering a question, which would be, why not play all the games from every series? My answer is, do you have a hundred dollars laying around? No? then shut up. But that's where I'm gonna end today's video. Thank you guys for watching. Comment below if you grew up playing these games, your experience with them, or if you didn't, then what games did you grow up with as a child? Also subscribe as that'll put a smile on my face. Now if you'll excuse me, I need to go practice for my addition and subtraction quiz tomorrow morning. But uh, yeah. Okay, bye.